Hello everyone, my name is Araceli Garcia and I am your ELA TOSA for the middle school and high school levels classes, but I also service the entire district when it has to do with some literacy skills. So I wanted to do a quick little recap of a PD I recently uh, hosted titled Engaging and uh, Speaking and Listening Strategies, uh, where I mainly talked about how do we get our kids to interact in an academic discussion, how to collaborate with one another, and how to bring back a little bit of more of that joy of students moving around, talking and engaging with the material that we give them. So again, uh, if you missed uh, the PD, then th this will be a nice little uh, information here for you. I also am going to add on uh, the comment section of this uh, YouTube link uh, the resources, including access to the Google Slides that has a lot of hyperlinks. All right, so let's jump in. All right, so this is the uh, learning objectives that we went through. We are going to always start with some data and some research. Then we'll talk about Kagan, which is, uh, again, a strategy that a lot of us got trained on a number of years ago, uh, and we still love using some of these tools. We'll also talk about another uh, set of strategies uh, founded by Kate Kinsella, who works a lot with English learners. Uh, and then we'll talk about some tech tools that you can use in your classroom. And at the very end, I'll talk about some spoken word opportunities for some of your older students. All right, so during the PD, one of the things I started with was, I always love to use Pear Deck as one of my go-to tools, not only for PDs, but if I were teaching in the classroom, I would definitely use Pear Deck uh, every day. And in the sense that it's an interactive Google slide presentation, or you could also use PowerPoint. And as we talk about listening and speaking skills, this is a great tool because students are doing work in your class. You're able to see what they are doing based on this computer program. You get real life uh, in real time information. So you can always change the pace of your lesson, maybe uh, stop and clarify, check for understanding, and the students are highly engaged. Now, I definitely do not agree with just putting students in front of a computer and letting them go. I believe in a dialogical type of discussion, right, where you are giving some info, letting them work through something, and then coming back and sharing out. So that's what I talk a lot about. So one of the first questions I asked is, do you know who's sitting in your classroom? Who is this Gen, Gen Z that we talk about? And do you know who Gen Alpha is and some of their characteristics? All right. Well, I talk a lot about Gen Z. These are our older teenagers, maybe high school kiddos. And they kind of share the same characteristics as our Gen Alpha. So Gen Alpha are the kiddos who are now middle school elementary. And they were the kids born in 2010, right? Uh, and, uh, you know, as one of the things that uh, the research says, these kids knew how to uh, use an a iPad before they can talk, before they can walk. So these kids were fully immersed in technology from the get-go. Right. So, yes, it is a highly technological generation and there are some pros and cons to that. So I'll let you kind of process a little bit of this infographic. You might agree. You might disagree, depending on which group of kids you have. Uh, and we all know, of course, this is not all students. However, there seems to be some trends and that's really what we have here. So some of the things I like to uh, you know, point out is this fact that they're definitely creative whether it's making things um, because they've seen other, you know, YouTube influencers and TikTok and they're seeing these things and then they're also doing, right, uh, such as producing their own little uh, videos or actually, you know, uh, highlighting a hobby that they have, whether it's makeup or designing things or artwork or music and they're publishing, right? So this idea of, you know, I'm going to give you skills that you might use in the future, right, for that future in the real world. Uh, I always tell teachers, no, their real world is happening right now. They are entrepreneurs, right? They are uh, marketing themselves. Uh, and so we want to make sure that they have the right skills and the right knowledge to, to be safe, but also to kind of, you know, uh, keep fueling that passion that they have. Uh, again, here's some other things that we want to take notice, right? Um, they're, they definitely believe that they should have access to private, right? So that their social media should not be, uh, you know, shared with anybody else. Um, so that's an interesting little, you know, statistic there. Like they don't want parents seeing what they're doing. Uh, they also, you know, they're, they question things. Uh, and as we see, especially with the Gen Z, they're a lot more weary of, say, for example, taking risks, including raising their hands, including uh, asking for help. 
whether that's a product of distance learning and COVID or just some generational trend, uh, but we are seeing a lot more students kind of apathetic towards maybe even higher education. They don't, they're kind of cynical towards, you know, getting a college degree is, is this class really going to help me in the long run? So we need to start thinking of kind of how do we change some of the way we're saying things so that we can uh, grab hold of their interests and engage them in things that they're passionate about. Take a look here. Three and four believe they should speak out against some kind of injustice or something that's uh, important to, to them. And some of them have even participated in marches or maybe even are aware of the world a lot more. All right, so it's something to think about. I welcome you to do your own research on Gen Alpha and Gen Z so we know who's sitting in that classroom, right? Okay, we are talking about speaking and listening. So we definitely wanna look at some of these standards that we have here. So I'm just kind of pointing out grade one standards and I'm just gonna highlight, I'm not gonna read it all. You know, we want them to participate in collaborative conversations with diverse partners. So not always at the same table, not always with the same, you know, shoulder partner. Um, can they agree on certain rules for discussions? Do they know how to manage that? We I always talk to, especially the older kids, uh, because of AI and chat GPT, I say, yes, you know, AI can do a lot of things, but one thing it can't do is shake your hand, you know, when you're walking into the room, make eye contact and have that humanity part. Are we teaching those skills which are going to be so needed in that future, right, when they are adults? So again, can they build on others' conversation? That means they're listening and adding to someone's conversation. Can they ask questions, higher level questions? Can they ask for help? So this is for first grade, and I like to show you also the 11th grade to 12th grade, same thing, right? Are they gonna participate in discussion, but are they prepared to have an academic discussion? Have they read and research material? This is great if you're doing Socratic seminars, which I'll talk about a little bit later. Do they know how to promote civil democratic discussions? How do I you know, have a conversation with someone I disagree with? This would be again, great for those class debates and we're teaching them how to have civil conversations. Can they propel conversations by posing questions? Many times the teacher is the one asking the question and the students are sitting quietly, often maybe just one student raises their hand or two, right? So how can we get them to ask questions? Uh, and finally, uh, can they respond thoughtfully to diverse perspectives? Can they synthesize what they're hearing and reading? So lots of great skills that we can talk about today. All right. What does the research say? So there's always a source here that is a hyperlink. I'm just going to read this part. It says research documents the dominance of the teacher voices in classrooms. Uh, Hattie's synthesis of studies on the topic detailed in his 2012 book, Visible Learning for Teachers, found that teachers talk 70% to 80% of class time on average. His own research produced an even higher average of 89%, right? And again, for our English learners, they need to develop the speaking skills, the listening skills, right? Um, how detrimental that might be to sit all day and have to just, you know, listen to information without them actually practicing and processing the information they're hearing. So I know when I was in the classroom, I used to ask a student who was sitting right in front of me and I would say, hey, I need you to time me. Tell me when I'm done in 10 minutes. I need to cut my lecture to 10 minutes and then turn it over to the students. So having a timer, keeping track. How much time are you speaking in those classes, right? How much time are you giving them time to interact? Uh, so just things to think about. Uh, here's some data. I always like to share some data. So take a look here. This is the data for California. And this is our data here for Hacienda La Puente. This is back based on the CASP for last year. And you could see here, right? Take a look at those scores. I'm going to look at the all grades. 13%, 13.27% in, in California are at above standard when it comes to uh, listening and understanding spoken information. That's again, uh, you know, if you're not able to listen to instructions, not able to listen to some discussion and process that information, that's the majority of, again, our, our learning is how do we process that listening skill? And in Hacienda La Puente, only 12.82% scored at above standard. So it is definitely a skill that we want to keep uh, working on and helping our students develop. All right, so what is on the cast? What exactly is being asked of them when they take that speaking and listen, uh, that listening portion of it? And of course, with the LPAC, 
it's even more rigorous when it comes to the speaking and listening. So, you know, you can pause the video and take a moment to, to read through some of this and, and kind of see the, the differences. Um, one of the biggest difference, of course, is I'm gonna go right here as a student listening procedures. For the CASP, students can play the audio individually and they can replay the audio, right? There is no transcript, but they can replay it to listen to it. On the ELK pack, on the other hand, the teacher plays the audio to the group of students and the audio is only played once and it's usually for about a, a minute or so, right? Or about, yeah. So, you know, if you've ever uh, proctored the LPAC, you'll know how challenging and rigorous it is for our students to score uh, pretty high on that test. So again, uh, you could take a look at that to, to drill down and see what exactly, you know, is being tested. All right. So what are some uh, awesome Kagan strategies? Again, this is a company that came out and, and there's a whole book and different, you know, you could find a lot of them online. And I went ahead and gave you a hyperlink there uh, to some of those resources. I'm just gonna highlight a few, all right? Um, so these are just, again, some of them are fun. Some of them, you know, you can adapt to your own course, uh, but a lot of it is letting go a little bit, like your students, giving them a chance to get up, move around. Of course, you have to have that classroom management. You know, I do a countdown, five, four, three, two, one, eyes on me, right? And I teach them how to do this. I practice, I directly teach them. This is my high school students. I would time them, okay, well, in 30 seconds, you need to move all your backpacks to the perimeter of the room. 30 seconds, go. Now you're going to put your chairs in a quad. You're going to make a group of four. You have 30 seconds, go. We would practice these routines. And then once they got it, you know, throughout the year, it was nice and smooth, those transitions. Um, and so we talk about that. All right, so here's one strategy. One of them is called All Right Round Robin. So here in Teams, students take turns responding, responding orally. So let's say I'm teaching study sync. They have some think questions rather than having them work individually or just online, get them into groups of three or four. Each student is gonna answer the same question. They're all gonna come like, wow, I think it should be, you know, I think uh, Lenny, you know, uh, his characteristics are this. Then the next person might add on. Yes, I agree. However, I'm also gonna add, you can give them sentence frames to help them build this skill. So all students are speaking and then they're all, maybe they all collaborate and decide who had the best answer. Oh, I like Joey's answer. Let me write that one down, right? So again, it's a different way of getting through information. Carousel feedback. I love this one for project presentations. I don't know about you, but sitting through 35 students coming up to the board and presenting their Google Slides can be very, again, unengaging. Uh, the students, the audience is usually just sitting there passively, right? And this could be for hours, uh, depending on how big your class is. Instead, what I started to do is groups of four or five, right? They all have their laptops. They're sharing maybe their Google Slides with everyone. And the student is walking them through the presentation. And then there's Q&A time. And that's valuable. This audience then, the small audience can ask them questions, clarifying questions, what if, right? Give some positive feedback, a lot more engaging than the whole group. I would then, of course, circulate, listen in, right? And I, my students would have some feedback forms, peer feedback forms. So that's another way. Of course, you know, you have other things like a gallery walk where you have posters up on the board and they're answering questions. Uh, how about this one? Fan and pick. Teammates play a card game to respond to each question. So let's say I take those, you know, quiz questions, maybe I did a studies, um, study guide, put them into small cards, cut them up, or maybe just handouts and make it a little game, right? Okay, choose a card. Okay, I'm gonna answer question three, right? Maybe it's a test review. Again, just a different way, just a little spin on how we might do things. Here's another one. Find someone who, students mix about the room, finding others who help them learn content or skill. Um, there's another one, another uh, routine called ha uh, stand up, hand up, pair up. Uh, my students were so trained in this, I already knew. And I, I like to add uh, music and we kind of do it like a musical chairs. Basically, uh, you know, I give them all my instructions. I say, okay, this is how we're gonna do this. You're gonna stand up, you're gonna walk around the room. When the music stops, you're gonna put your hand up you're gonna you know, give a high five to whoever's standing the closest and you're gonna share out some information. And I do funny things like whoever has the longest hair is gonna start first. 
uh, whoever is the youngest is going to start first, right? And so just kind of do a more relaxed atmosphere for them to share some information. Think about how different that would be than just sitting in rows all day long, just doing work on a computer. Our students need to practice discussing, talking, collaborate, awkward conversations. How do I talk to someone I don't even know, right? Those are skills that are important also, not just the content in our, in our, in our schools and in our education. Okay, what else? How about find the fiction? Just like we have two truths and a lie, you could do the same thing with uh, maybe the book you're reading, if they're reading, uh, let's say, Animal Farm. Uh, so the students can write these down. So very minimum work on your end, and the students are going to try to figure out, no, that one's not correct, and the reasons why. Make it a game. I love using this one too, concentric circles, or I used to set them up as parallel lines. Had a half of the class would stand, uh, you know, against the wall, right, facing in, and then I would pair up a student to stand right in front of another. So we have A and B, and I would say, okay, students, standing closest to the wall is going to start first. You're going to talk for two minutes. You're going to summarize what you know about, you know, the Great Depression. Go. And I would time them. And I'd walk, right? Circulate always to listen in. And then I would say, okay, time's up. Partner B, give them feedback. Good job. All right. I really like, right? Now we're going to switch roles. Person B is going to now uh, summarize what they know about the book of Mice and Men. Go. And they, you know, share. And then if I want to do this a few times, I'd have row maybe B, one of the rows, rotate one or two students so they're working with a new partner. Again, just adding uh, opportunities for them to keep sharing out, to keep uh, synthesizing information, uh, and again, you know, communicating their thoughts before they start to do the writing that they need to do. Great uh, idea for brainstorming, especially if they're about to do some kind of writing task. Okay, a couple other ones. Uh, using question cards, uh, students quiz a partner, get quizzed by a partner, and then trade cards. So same thing, maybe instead of giving the traditional uh, you know, study guide, they can quiz each other. Uh, here's another one, rally coach. One student has a paper, let's say they're writing a short little paragraph um, using a formula, or maybe they're writing a summary. The coach, almost like a peer coach, doesn't have to be, it could be any level. You don't have to get just only your more advanced students. Um, that student's kind of just saying, no, I think you need to include the character names. Oh, don't forget to add the title and the author, right? And so the scribe is basically being coached, and then you switch roles. So it's both have that opportunity. Same thing here, Rally Robin. In pair, students alternate, maybe just doing oral responses, right? Uh, list as many characters in the play, The Crucible, and give some characteristics, go. And, you know, you always want to make sure you have the different levels of questions, not just fact and information and memorization, but the whys, right? The what ifs, what are the themes, things like that. All right. There are many other, uh, you know, Kagan strategies. Again, there's a whole entire book. If you wish to order the book, you can talk to your administrator, your uh, department chair, and see if they can, if they still have some of those books laying around, or if you can order some. Um, but another one, great one, is the Kagan uh, discussion mat. And I gave you, uh, sending you here a link to, uh, you know, just a Google Doc that you can print out. I know I printed many of these out, put them on tables. The kids already knew your person one, two, three, four. Person three, you're going to begin. Everyone's going to go around and share some information. So again, I'm getting efficient with my groupings and getting efficient with how we collaborate so that throughout the year, we're not wasting time, right? And, and our kids are used to, it's just part of this. This is the way we run class here. We don't allow students to just shrug their shoulders and not participate. You're going to participate in some form. Uh, and, and, and again, you know, be weary of students who have social anxiety and, and things like that, but find outlets for them, right? Maybe they talk to just one partner. Maybe they just talk to you. All right, take a moment and process that information. Think about which strategies might you want to use. Try one at a time. I know, you know, especially kids, they can get a little rowdy, but you know, I've had very few discipline issues because my classes were engaging. Uh, I had more issues when the class was just kind of very passive and kids got bored and then they didn't want to do the work. So yes, it might seem like, oh, you know, they might get a little chaotic. I call it organized chaos, but they're engaged and more importantly, also they're learning, right? Okay, let's keep going. What are other strategies? 
How about Kate Kinsella? So Kate Kinsella, you can read here a little bit. Uh, she works a lot with English learners, especially long-term English learners. So I'm just going to read this part right here. She has publications and instructional programs that focus on career and college readiness for academic English learners with an emphasis on academic interaction, high utility vocabulary development, informational text reading, and scholarly writing across subjects. So notice again that emphasis on the academic portion of discussions. So if you click here, you'll have access to this handout. Oh, I lied. Well, let me try that again. I will give you, uh, again, let's see if it goes, access to the handout uh, called uh, Talking Frames. Uh, let me pause the video and, and get access to that. Give me one second. I will make sure that link is correct so you can have access to this. So here is, I basically just, uh, you know, give you uh, lots of frames. I'll give you lots of frames. I won't talk about all of them, but just here's just a few. So again, let's say I want students to share some information. So, you know, they've just read a passage, so maybe a book on science or social science. Take a look at these sentence starters, right? Uh, am I correct in assuming that? You know, kids are giggle and they're kind of laugh because it sounds so, you know, kind of, uh, you know, fake, if you will. But we're just practicing how to use this kind of academic language because they're going to encounter that when they're reading, when they're taking those high stakes exams. So, you know, again, if uh, if you have understood, if I have understood you correctly, your point is, how do I synthesize someone? How do I write a uh, paraphrase someone's information? So this is, again, a nice little frame here. Uh, how about, you know, compare and contrast is a very challenging uh, writing skill for many of our students. So the more we can have them practice speaking this before they start writing and compare contrast, let's say essay, right? Uh, one similarity, whereas, right, uh, similarly in contrast, so these are great sentence uh, starters, even as little short discussions before you start class, uh, you know, as your warm ups. Again, sequencing, clarifying, and uh, analyzing, uh, predicting, so many of these, right? I love this one, persuading and justifying. I love this for Socratic seminars and debates, right? Based on the evidence presented so far, I believe that hot Cheetos should be sold at schools because, right, uh, it is vital to consider. So lots of great, again, more sentence frames, uh, some academic, vocabulary that they can use in any classroom. So I'll leave you this so that you can uh, have access to it. Like I said, I'll make sure that link uh, is correct. All right, let's keep going. Talking about Socratic Seminar, here's a short video. I'm not going to play it right now. You can pause the video and, and watch it. But how do you conduct a Socratic Seminar? If you are really curious and you need any of, uh, you know, you want to observe a teacher doing this, you could definitely ask. Uh, you know, your, your administrator, if you can have a period to go observe a teacher doing this, or I'm always available to come in and do a model lesson with you. We could do a co-teaching lesson where we could sit, plan out a Socratic seminar, and I can help guide the students in having this kind of discussion. Please, you can always email me and we could set something like this up. It was one of the most powerful strategies and tools that I have used in my classroom. The students love discussing and debating, right? And so uh, I highly recommend using Socratic seminars. Uh, all right, the video is gonna play there, but okay. Here's another great uh, strategy you might wanna use. I know that this is used often in elementary schools, but I would say bring it to all of your classrooms, including middle and high school, and that is class jobs. Uh, one of my coworkers, uh, Ms. Jenny LeBron, did this great PowerPoint that I'm attaching here. Uh, but I also have a list of class jobs that I created um, right after the pandemic to get students talking. A lot of them kind of shut down. They wanted to have their earphones on. They wanted to have their mask on. They wanted to almost have like camera off, even though we're sitting there in class. Like they did not want to be seen. They did not want to participate. So one of the things I did was I created a list of class jobs where students can have jobs such as the class DJ, or I'm gonna show you this one here. Uh, maybe they were uh, the sports reporter for the school. What are some you know, events happening? Uh, what are some, here's, uh, I'll give you a list. What are some ASB activities that are happening, right? So rather than having the announcements, which are important, but maybe you have somebody clarifying that or expanding on those. Uh, maybe there's a word of the day. 
I used to have a kid who did a cheesy joke of the day. And it was so awesome because this kid, we knew this kid was on the autistic spectrum, yet his ability, and he was so willing, he volunteered. He wanted to do a cheesy joke of the day. And the kids loved that. And they really built some kind of class rep uh, rapport. Um, I used to have a class president in all of my classes. They were in charge of giving the welcome. They had a callback signal. Sometimes they had silly ones like, uh, we will, you know, we will, we will rock you, right? And the whole class would just pay attention. They would greet the class. They would do an inspirational quote. Um, the vice president would go over the agenda, the day's lesson. The other uh, vice president would go over some of the homework and clarify. And I stood on the side and cheered them on and took attendance, right? So letting go a little bit and letting your students take hold of that. Uh, one of the other thing I did is I created a Padlet wall where students can then do their own special reports on mental health, uh, maybe uh, their own like uh, national sports they're into, maybe there's a certain hobby. And then this was a board that we shared with the class. And then every so often during the week, students would speak on those topics. So creating a space of high interest uh, topics to be discussed in class, right? All right, and so I'll leave you that. It has some links there. All right, finally, some tech tools. I love the idea of students podcasting. That, you know, podcasting it has taken off. People are sitting in cars for a long period of time. Some kids are listening, right, as they're walking home. Little kids, for some reason, love those crime scene podcasts, right? So, Padlet, if you're not familiar with Padlet, I can, you know, you can email me, I can help you set that up. It's free for teachers. Students could do an audio recording. Imagine, they just finished reading a, a, a work uh, or they just finished studying a unit. Get a group of three or four students, hit record, have them have a discussion, kind of like a, you know, the view or a, sitting around a, a table and they're discussing this, these deep ideas. Beautiful. Kids are practicing their speaking. Sometimes they have to pause and re-record because they messed up. They want to get the language correct. They want to get the tone correct. So much more powerful when they know that there's an authentic audience rather than I'm just turning this into my teacher. If you tell them we're going to do a podcast and it's going to be put on the school's website or we're going to share it with other students, it just changes their, uh, again, you know, their will to do a good job, right, when they know that. Uh, our kids are kind of public that way, right? They have a public image. And so we can build off of that, you know, skill that they already have of being TikTok video makers or, uh, you know, Snapchat video makers. Why not bring it into the classroom? Use those tech tools that they already have and add the academic side to it. So I'm including a little tutorial on how to do a, a podcast. Uh, here, in fact, is... Uh, a lovely group that I got to meet, and that was the La Puente High School. Many of these are seniors from last year. They graduated. But they, through their criminal justice program, put together a podcast called Bowl of Serial, Serial Killers. And they talked about and researched, um, you know, famous, infamous killers such as, uh, you know, the Black Dahlia case. Uh, and they talked about Turnbull Canyon. They talked about uh, Richard Ramirez. These were topics they found interesting. They went out and did the research. They did the script. They recorded and re-recorded and re-recorded. Uh, and not only that, they also were in charge of marketing. So they had to make the flyers. They had to post it. They put social media, uh, little short commercials, right? Promo videos. Great skills, real life skills that they can now take into, into the world, right? So again, you can see those on your own. Uh, other places that you can record uh, through Canvas, you have a program called Canvas Studio. Uh, they can work on their own. You can work with partners or small groups. Again, rather than showing a video, they can actually record their analysis, their summary. They can ask questions. They can say, for example, they wrote an essay. They got feedback. They can talk, give feedback to a peer on how the student did or how they think they did on an essay or a test. So lots of great, you know, uh, ideas, and there's a little tutorial on that. Uh, and here is, I'm uh, very proud of this group of students. These were some sixth graders from Nelson Elementary. And basically we took Study Sync, one of their writing prompts, and instead of just having the students write a very disconnected prompt, which is, uh, you know, choose two characters who had a turning point and write about 
Then we took this same prompt and made it more personal. I call it the deeper learning prompt. And so what they did is choose someone in your family or a friend who has had a significant turning point in their life and do an interview. And so here are these students, and this is just one of them, who did an amazing job interviewing, in this case, a mom. And if you watch it, get some tissue because it's, it's an emotional one. And these kids loved this project so much, they kept talking about it all year long, right? Because it was meaningful, it was relevant to their lives. And again, we're working on those, those speaking skills. And the parents were so proud of these kiddos. All right, and again, you can watch that on your own. Uh, and finally, let's talk about another great uh, way to get our students to talk and share, and that is through spoken word. And so there is a great program uh, that maybe you can find also on, uh, you know, if you're interested, find it on YouTube, see some samples, and that is spoken word, right? Spoken word competitions. And I know that this uh, date is, you know, all, we're almost there. So we might not be able to meet this date, but just to keep it in mind for other years, especially if you have older students, um, but there is a competition on spoken word and it, you know, you might want to have just one in your own classroom. I taught poetry for many years as part of the AP program. However, poetry is meant to be spoken, right? Uh, and so some of our students love music, many of our students. So, you know, having them do a rap song, having them do a, a, a script, you know, or a poem out loud in front of others is powerful. So here is again a spoken word opportunity and here's another one this one is from poetry out loud and this is for grades 9 through 12 and you can see here the date that is going to be uh, offered so and you can attend some of the trainings and this is through lego all right and so finally i leave you with this uh, choice board for teachers and all the different things i kind of talked about and then some these are all hyperlinks to tutorials and more information on how to use things. All right, finally, some other resources that you can have access to. I do print, uh, create a district-wide newsletter where I highlight what students and teachers are doing. So I try to send that out once a month. Uh, so if you have any student work that you'd like to showcase, send me an email, let me know, and I'll showcase it on this newsletter. There's also our CIA Canvas page. And if you go to ELA, you'll find a lot of the resources I talked about. Um, and, uh, you know, this is an old one, but I also have some PD, after school PDs, that I will be doing at the beginning of next semester. All right. Thank you so much. And here is my information. If you ever need to contact me, and you'll see some of the other places where I share my info. Thank you so much. And again, those of you who attended the PD, thank you for attending.